Hello and welcome back. Uh, in this session, we'll look at chapters uh, 5 and 6. We'll uh, talk about uh, the wine shop chapter, which is uh, symbolically rich uh, in some of the themes that Dickens explores in Tale of Two Cities. Now, uh, this is the section that I would like you to look at closely and uh, let me read this dialogue. And yes, and the beautiful world we live in when it is possible and when many other such things are possible and not only possible but done, done. See you under that sky there every day. Long live the devil, let us go on. Uh, this is the conversation uh, between the wine shop owner, Mr. Defarge, and uh, Mr. Laurie. And Mr. Laurie is struck by the fact that uh, there is so much horror in the world. Uh, there is almost an element of naivety in Mr. Laurie's um, thoughts here when uh, he uh, reflects a lot of uh, wonder and surprise at the way the world is. And um, Defarge says that uh, evil is uh, happening every day. Things bad things are possible not only possible it's it's happening it's done and um he is uh dejected he's very pessimistic and he uh, asks to go on the context for this uh, conversation is that uh, mr lorry and uh, miss manette have come uh, to the wine shop to get back uh, Dr. Manette, who is uh, um, housed uh, in an attic on top of the wine shop. And uh, they have uh, found um, Defarge, and Defarge is uh, going to take them to the attic in order to uh, release, uh, quote unquote, uh, 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 you know, free um, Dr. Manette to his relative and friend. What is uh, significant about that scene is that even before uh, Mr. Laurie and Miss Minette and uh, Defarge uh, go to the attic uh, which has um, Dr. Minette inside, we have uh, three other people looking at uh, Dr. Minette through a hole in the uh, door and uh, they are uh, looking at him as a sort of a spectacle and uh, Mr. Laurie is not very happy at this turn of events and uh, it's a very interesting scene um, because um, you know if you read the narrative closely we have Dr. Uh, uh, we have Defarge, we have, uh, mm, uh, we have Mr. Laurie and we have Miss Minette who are being taken um, who are being guided by uh, Defarge and they climb a, a, a kind of a winding staircase and they go to the top and uh, when they go to the top they see uh, other people uh, looking through a, a hole um, in, in the wall and uh, they uh, kind of uh, look at Dr. Manette as if they are looking at some kind of animal, some kind of creature, some kind of um, you know uh, object that is uh, entertaining the three of them. And this makes uh, Mr. Laurie ask him this question, do you make a show of Monsieur uh, Manette? And he says that I show him in the way you have seen to a chosen few. So he says that those who are uh, looking at that spectacle have been chosen by me and they are the selected few. And uh, Dr. Um, uh, and Mr. Laurie asks, is that well? Is that all right? And he says, I think it is well. And there's an emphasis on this uh, I. It's, it's, um, that emphasis is in the original too. And he says that I think it's all right. And you know, that's enough, that's sufficient. I make the decision. Uh, and uh, Laurie asks, who are the few? How do you choose them? How do you select the people who look at Dr. Manette as if he is a creature who is entertaining them? And he says, um, Defat says, I choose them as real men of my name. Jacques is my name, to whom the sight is likely to do good. Enough, you are English, that's another thing. 
then when Mr. Laurie asks, what is the criteria for you to decide on who is going to look at um, Dr. Manette, he says that um, the men I choose are real men. There's a lot of uh, genuine aspect to them. Um, they are not fake in any way. They're not superficial in any way. And they have my name, which is Jacques. So all of them who look at Dr. Manette are called Jacques. And Jacques is a, a code name to mean uh, that they are all part of the group that wants change in France, radical change in France. All of these men want to see the revolution uh, come and change the lives of the people. And he says that this spectacle would do good to those who look at Dr. Uh, Menet. And he says that that's that's enough, you are English, you will not understand um, the point of my uh, lesson that I'm giving to uh, Jacques, who look at Dr. Menet. So this is an important scene uh, in the sense that uh, Dr. Manette is made a spectacle of uh, to a chosen few. Why is he be um, be um, becoming a spectacle? What is the reason? Uh, the reason is that he will offer some kind of lesson in life, lesson about society, some kind of message that will inspire the Jacques, uh, the men uh, who come and look at him and inspire them to do something. And what is that something that we will come to know about it as the novel progresses. Uh, so it, it, the uh, novel is uh, playing upon an important idea of uh, becoming uh, something for somebody, uh, you know, uh, you know, being a motivator for somebody. And um, the other interesting point about this uh, chapter is that uh, we see Dr. Manet not imprisoned. He is not uh, imprisoned in the Bastille. In fact, we never see Dr. Manet imprisoned in the Bastille. Uh, we see him imprisoned in the attic of the wine shop. So uh, that is also very significant. Um, it's the Defarge, uh, the Defarges who are the prisoners of uh, Dr. Manet in some sense, even though we know that uh, Dr. Manet uh, has been a Bastille prisoner for about 18 years and then he has been released and then he has been uh, sent to Defarge who has been, uh, who had been a servant of the family long ago. We know all this, we know all this through, um, you know, bits and pieces of embedded narrative, but um, as the narrative unfolds, we are introduced to Dr. Manet not within the Bastille prison uh, cell, uh, not within uh, the North Tower of the Bastille, but within the attic of the wine shop. So uh, it is also important uh, to understand that in some sense, the Defarges are also prisoners of Dr. Manet. This is the illustration by Hablet Knight Brown uh, of the scene where we see uh, Laurie Defarge, Manette, and Miss Manette, uh, you know, meeting uh, one another for the first time. It's a very important uh, illustration uh, among all the illustrations of uh, Fish for A Tale of Two Cities. Uh, let's do a bit of close reading of this illustration. Uh, look at the halo that surrounds um, Dr. Manette and uh, Miss Manette. It's a sacred halo almost. And look at the way that Dr. Manette and Miss Manette have been uh, divided from these two figures. Um, so they, they have somehow uh, within that limited space and limited time um, become a family. Father and daughter have become a family. Uh, a kind of a, a incipient domesticity is formed here in the scene and that domesticity um, sets the others outside of uh, that family. And between the two of them, uh, it is important to note that Defarge, this is Defarge, Defarge is showing his back to the reader 
and we have uh, Mr. Laurie standing obediently, loyally uh, by the side of the um, family there. The fact that uh, Defarge is showing his back also indicates that he might become a turncoat. He might turn on the doctor at some point in the story. He might uh, betray um, the family in some way. He might uh, be disloyal to Dr. Minette in some way at some point in the novel. And um, the fact that Mr. Laurie has his head bowed down shows perhaps his helplessness. at some points in the story when he's unable to deliver uh, the family to safety. So this is a picture that is symbolically rich in nature. We have incipient domesticity, we have betrayal hinted at, we have um, the desire to guard and um, we have uh, expression of helplessness uh, as well in this illustration. Now let's look at chapter 6, The Shoemaker. Who is the shoemaker? It is Dr. Minette who is the shoemaker. Uh, in fact, Dr. Minette occupies his time by making uh, shoes, women's shoes. And um, this is the pastime of Dr. Minette when he was uh, in the Bastille and that is the pastime uh, for him when he is within the attic of the wine shop. The task of recalling him from the vacancy into which he always sank when he had spoken was like recalling some very weak person from a swoon or endeavoring in the hopes of uh, in the hope of some disclosure to stay the spirit of a fast dying man. This section tells us that it is very difficult to recall Dr. Manette, that old man uh, in the attic. Uh, it is very uh, you know, difficult to make him realize that he is not within the prison, uh, the Bastille. In fact, he is a, a free man who is uh, uh, living for a period in the uh, wine shop. And um, the narrator says that um, recalling him, the word recall is used quite often in this chapter, uh, recalling him, bringing him back to himself uh, was um, like recalling a man who is unconscious and um, it is like recalling uh, somebody uh, to uh, realize that he is uh, not a, a prisoner and it is like recalling a man who is fast dying. It's like um, making a man uh, stop from uh, dying and he says that um, did you ask for my name? And he says, uh, assuredly, I did. Mr. Laurie says, I did. Um, and uh, 105 North Tower, uh, what is, uh, that is the name of the man. And he says, is that all? 105 North Tower. So when he is asked about his name uh, by Defarge, he says that uh, uh, my name is 105 North Tower. That is the number that he, his um, cell had when uh, Dr. Minette was a prisoner within the Bastille. So he's asked uh, if he's a shoemaker by trade and he says that no, I was not a shoemaker by trade. I learnt it here. I learnt it in the prison in Bastille. Here is reference to the Bastille. But uh, there's an irony here, as I mentioned before, that the Bastille is here, uh, not the actual prison, but the wine shop. So the wine shop is also some sense uh, a prison for Dr. Minette. I taught myself, I asked leave. He says that this is a, a, a trade that I learned by myself. I asked permission to learn it. He then lapsed away even for a few minutes, wringing those measure changes on his hands the whole time. His eyes came slowly back at last to the face from which they had wandered when they rested on it. He started and resumed in the manner of a sleeper that moment awake, reverting to a subject of last night. So uh, as he is talking, he goes back to his earlier state of uh, becoming oblivious to everybody who is around him. Uh, the present conversation becomes as if it's a conversation of last night. Uh, and he says, um, again, after a while, I asked leave to teach myself. I got it with 
much difficulty after a long while and I have made shoes ever since. He says that it was difficult to get permission even to learn this trade, uh, this task, but once I've uh, got the permission, I have made shoes um, since then. So we can see that this is the state of mind of a man who has suffered quite a lot in his life. It, it is um, the result of 18 long years of imprisonment. So he is completely, uh, almost uh, completely damaged psychologically and he cannot believe, he does not realize that he is a free man. And in fact, he obsessively makes shoes and um, making shoes becomes an escapism for uh, Dr. Manette and he wants to cling to that activity because not doing it would mean uh, um, that he would realize that he is a prisoner and that would be hellish to uh, realize and uh, be aware of. That he had no recollection whatever of his having been brought from his prison to that house was apparent to them. So it's very clear that um, he doesn't realize that he has shifted from uh, the Bastille to the wine shop. Uh, the word house is interesting in this regard because the wine shop uh, is the house of the Defages. And that house is also symbolically the Bastille for Dr. Manette. So there's a lot of irony in this setting which I would like you to uh, be aware of. They heard him mutter 105 North Tower and when he looked about him it evidently was for the strong um, fortress walls which had long encompassed him. On their reaching the courtyard, he instinctively altered his tread as being in expectation of a drawbridge and when there was no drawbridge and he saw the carriage waiting in the open street, he dropped his daughter's hand and clasped his head again. Now what is happening in this scene is that Mr. Laurie, Miss Manette and Defarge are bringing Dr. Manette out of the attic and they're taking him down by the staircase and they're taking him into the courtyard and as he is moving uh, out of the attic and down the stairs he is uh, instinctively looking for the fortress walls, the walls of the Bastille uh, but he is unable to find that and um, he uh, becomes slightly disoriented by that fact and uh, in fact when he reaches the court uh, ground level uh, he kind of changes the way he walks, uh, he alters his tread, his footsteps because he is uh, anticipating a drawbridge. Uh, that drawbridge is um, present in front of the Bastille, not in front of the wine shop. But um, in his mind, Dr. Manant is still uh, in the vicinity of the Bastille. So he is anticipating the drawbridge and when there is no drawbridge, he like, once again uh, becomes disoriented because instead of the drawbridge, there is just a carriage waiting in the open street. That open space itself um, becomes um, difficult for Dr. Manette to understand and make sense of. So he drops his daughter's hand and clasps his head uh, as if he's in pain. So this shift is very difficult for Dr. Manette to undergo and that uh, tells us the readers of the psychological uh, damage, the trauma that he has suffered because of long uh, hidden imprisonment. Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.